Hello and welcome to today's lunchtime presentation. Uh, for those who, of you who don't know me, my name is Daniel Hogan and I am the chairman of SIWM Northern Ireland branch. Uh, if this is your first time, time joining us um, today, the purpose of these lunchtime uh, webinar series is, was really to complement the 2020 to 2021 technical programme. Uh, and the programme theme of the year was water and the environment adapting to change. So in line with that theme, um, today's presentation uh, will be on the evolution of uh, marine wildlife survey design. So this presentation will review hopefully the evolution of offshore seabird and marine mammal surveys uh, as most regularly used by the offshore energy industry. It'll hopefully cover the transition from boat based surveys to aerial digital survey methods and uh, the talk will hopefully expand on the changes in survey design that have been seen in the industry over the past 10 years in the UK and indeed global waters. And um, so as we look into the future and, and as the options become available with advancing technology. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this event is being recorded. So um, just for your information and it will be made available on the SciWEM website and also on the SciWEM YouTube, um, YouTube channel. So if you haven't already done so, it's definitely worth subscribing to. So it keeps you up to date with all past events if you've missed them. So if you've experienced any technical issues issues throughout this presentation and need assistance, please use the chat feature on Zoom and uh, let us know what the problem is and what help is required. Uh, we'll also be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So if you want to ask a question, please feel free to do so, but use the Q&A facility on Zoom and uh, the chat notes, should, the chat will only be used for technical issues only. Uh, as always, this event counts for one hour of CPD, but SIWEM do not um, provide CPD certificates. So our speakers today are uh, Dr. Kate Rogerson uh, from APEM. Uh, thank you very much for coming along today, Kate. Uh, Kate is a senior consultant at APEM Limited, working within the Marine Division. Uh, Kate specializes in managing projects, collecting data on offshore bird and marine mammal distributions. Uh, this includes lease areas for offshore wind farms and monitoring of SPAs. Um, Kate is involved with creating survey designs to meet client needs, uh, along with analysing the data and delivering reports and data to clients. Kate is also joined today by uh, Randall Cunahan from APEM Ireland, which has just been established in September 2020. Uh, Randall has a broad range in marine exploration and construction industry, working on, uh, on board a variety of ships responsible for uh, monitoring marine mammal activities using both visual and acoustic methods. Uh, Randall has been involved in cetacean uh, research since 2005. He has assisted the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group and the Shannon Dolphin and Wildlife Foundation on several field studies uh, of cetacean in Irish water in Irish waters. Uh, these projects have involved the study of many uh, marine mammals, including bottlenose, common and Arctic whiteside dolphins, harbour porpoise uh, and humpback mink and fin whales using uh, both visual surveys and acoustic methods like PAM and SAMS. And also we have Stephanie McGovern from APEM UK. Uh, Stephanie uh, has worked at APEM for nine years and is uh, currently head of Marine Wildlife Survey Team. Uh, Stephanie has undertaken density surface modeling to predict bird distributions, data analysis work and collision risk assessments for a number of aerial surveys uh, uh, and offshore wind farms um, across the UK, Ireland, Germany and the US. Uh, Stephanie has gained experience on a number of offshore wind farm projects uh, and has developed an in-depth knowledge of survey methodology used for ornithology and marine mammal surveys. Uh, and in 2011, uh, created APEM's bespoke Berg bird migration model uh, MigroPath, which is subsequently used in multiple round three EIAs. Uh, Stephanie has completed her PhD thesis on the impact of long-term environmental change, which involves statistical analysis of large multivariate data sets. Um, so as such, Stephanie is skilled in, in the use of OR, uh, which is a language of, for environmental statistical commuting and graphics uh, and other models of data analysis. 
So that's our three speakers. Uh, Kate is going to lead the presentation and we have Randall and, and Stephanie uh, on standby for the Q&A. So Kate, over to you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you everyone else um, for joining me today on this, um, for this webinar. Um, oh, sorry, let me get my clicker ready. There we go. So yeah, so um, today I'm going to uh, talk to you about the evolution of marine wildlife survey design um, and how that sort of changed over the last almost decade now. Um, so quickly, a couple of the things that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, in this presentation. So firstly, I'll just give you a quick introduction to APEM um, and our sort of background, then an introduction to wild, offshore wildlife surveys um, and why you'd want to undertake them. And then we get onto the sort of meat of it, the um, evolution from visual to digital surveys, uh, changes in survey design that are also evolving and statistical analysis that's undertaken. And then at the end, I'll just um, talk about what we see um, happening in the future. And then hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. Uh, so Daniel's already gone into depth um, of uh, about all the people that are on the panel today. Uh, just quickly, so yeah, Steph has been at APEM for nine years. Um, and yeah, she's been, she, She's sort of been involved and has seen all the changes um, to the marine wildlife survey design that I'm going to be talking about today. And she does specialise in the methods to analyse the data. And then Randall, um, so it's part of the APEM Ireland office, which opened last year and has uh, extensive experience of monitoring and surveying, surveying marine mammals. And then there's me, a senior consultant um, in the marine wildlife survey team. Um, and I manage projects uh, that um, involve survey programs and undertake the statistical analysis of the data we get from those um, surveys. So APEM as a whole is a global environmental consultancy. Um, we have an integrated approach to cover all areas of the natural environment and we use innovative um, technology to provide um, uh, data, um, excellent data for our clients um, and the regulators. So APEM has offices across the UK, uh, along with the Ireland office that opened last year and has um, works with consultants in the US and Germany. The Marine Wildlife Survey team is mostly um, based in the UK, England and, and Scotland, um, but we currently operate aerial surveys across the globe and have been doing so for the last 10 years. Um, so we've been delivering them yeah, in all these locations that you can see here um, and for, for a number of reasons and, and we deliver our um, advice on them, to, to deliver advice from the data that we collect on these surveys to the clients and um, a large number of those clients are in the offshore wind industry. So onto the marine wildlife surveys. So why would you want to undertake the um, offshore or marine wildlife surveys? Um, well, the most the sort of the, the most common application of the surveys is to characterise a site. Um, so you want to see the abundance, distribution, and behaviour of birds, marine mammals, and other megafauna that use the site. And this is really crucial for the offshore wind farm industry. This data feeds into the um, assessments such as the environmental impact assessment. And also crucially for this, uh, for the offshore wind industry, um, surveys can be undertaken pre-construction and post-construction so that you can um, see the changes in the populations of birds and mammals that use the site um, and yeah, see how they continue to use it once the uh, wind farm is in operation. So, um, the marine wildlife surveys started out with uh, visuals using visual survey methods uh, and these were um, traditionally um, surveys from um, boats, so boat based surveys. Uh, on these boats there were highly experienced field scientists recording um, species, uh, identifying the species that they saw, the, the numbers that they saw. Um, and the advantages were that the um, experts and these um, field scientists were able to identify nuances between similar looking species and record other environmental factors that they saw in the flesh while that survey was taking place. Um, these surveys also um, have very large transects as the, as the boat um, crosses the site. Uh, your transect is as, as, is as wide as the eye or the binocular can see. 
However, there are disadvantages to the visual um, survey methods, uh, particularly for the boat um, method of boat based surveys um, birds, some bird species will be attracted to survey boats because those boats are often um, old fishing vessels, uh, while other species are highly sensitive to disturbance by boats and so will avoid the boats and this causes a bias in the data from those surveys. Um, additionally, uh, identification made in the field cannot be checked after the survey, you just have to rely on that expert's uh, judgment at that time. Um, and then the data that you get from the visual surveys also has to be modelled and corrected for to be used in future analysis and that's because the um, ability to detect a bird gets more difficult with greater distance from from the observer and so you have to um, model for that detection a bit uh, detection uh, ability um, so that yeah so you have to sort of try and correct the data afterwards it's not um, it's not foolproof but it is what has to be done to the data from visual surveys so visual surveys, they started on boats and they did move to planes and visual surveys, um, visual area surveys are undertaken. They, uh, they use low flying aircraft with field um, scientists on board to ID the birds from above. But however, because they're, they're low flying, they can sometimes cause, dis cause disturbance to the wildlife. So these limitations of the visual survey methods um, led to the development of the digital um, the digital aerial survey methods. So these are undertaken using aircraft uh, provided with powerful camera systems on board that capture high resolution imagery. And these do have a number of benefits over the visual um, survey methods. So there's improved health and safety, and that's because you're flying at a higher altitude. And this high altitude also gives you um, the benefits of not being not disturbing the wildlife. And you can also survey large areas very quickly. There's also benefits to the data because you're surveying the large areas um, quickly, you're reducing double counting of spe um, species and you're getting a more true snapshot of the species usage of that site at that time. Uh, and also um, the data doesn't have to be corrected for after a survey, um, un unlike visual data as I've explained. And um, finally, you can be fully confident in the high quality data you're getting from your digital um, survey. And that's because you have a permanent record of the survey, the, um, the imagery that's taken from the, um, on, from the survey, and that um, can be audited and undergo quality control. So you can have multiple species experts looking at an image to ID um, the species, uh, whereas, from the visual uh, survey methods, you're just, yeah, it's just that one person uh, IDing at that one particular time. It can't be can't be checked again. So there's definitely benefits to and um, the disadvantages of the visual survey methods were definitely why the digital aerial um, survey methods evolved and, um, and were developed. And there are currently two main digital aerial survey techniques used. Oh, sorry. It's not working. Yeah. Um, so there are currently two main digital aerial survey techniques uh, high resolution digital still imagery and high definition video methods. So APEM have compared digital stills and video, but uh, found some limitations associated with the video methods, which is why we strongly recommend the use of still imagery. Um, so still cameras um, don't have rolling shutters, and so they don't have. Uh, there's no associated image distortion with those running shutters. Um, you could, there is sometimes an assumed benefit from video methods where, that you would have multiple frames to ID a, uh, an individual species from, but the, the, the video is, is actually very short, so that's the frames um, from less than a second of video. And actually, uh, we found that there's a huge benefit of just having high resolution still images um, to visit to see diagnostic characteristics of the species within that image. Um, and then uh, cameras, or the way that APEM sets up their still cameras is that the cameras are orientated vertically. And that means that we can capture uh, into the water column to, to be able to also survey for marine mammals as well. And then another uh, benefit of the way we, uh, the way APEM sets up 
the still cameras is that we actually know where that each image is in, in space. So we have the coordinates for that image. And that means that we have the known coverage for each image and for the whole survey. Um, and that has benefits um, for the analysis after um, your survey as well. So, yeah, so um, for still imagery, um, we're currently uh, delivering surveys at 1.5 centimeter ground sample distance. And this is the pixel resolution of the images that we take with our cameras. And this means sort of in real, um, uh, yeah, so something that you can um, think about is that each pixel um, in the image measures 1.5 centimeters on the sea surface. So we've got really high quality um, images so that we can really identify the birds um, to species level. Um, so we currently have brought on two new camera systems in 2021. And so we're, so APEM can currently um, deliver high volumes of coverage um, of these high quality images. And we're continually reviewing and updating the technology to provide the best data. So currently I'm talking about 1.5 cent centimeter uh, GSD and you know, 10 years ago, that was five centimeters. So we're really, um, the technology is progressing all the time um, and we're trying to keep up with it. So um, so the, so we have this, these up-to-date camera systems providing us with the 1.5 centimeter pixel resolution images. And then we also have an expert team of image analysts um, so that we can identify uh, more than 95% of birds and meg megafauna to species level. So this are just a couple, sort of an array of species that we've been able to identify from our surveys from around the world. Um, so some that I'll just draw your attention to. So on the bottom left hand picture, uh, some rays, and these are all within the water column, this picture. So you wouldn't be able to take this um, image. Oh, you wouldn't be able to see these rays from a video um, aerial survey. And these, we know that these rays are migrating along the east coast of uh, North America. Uh, so it's really fantastic behavior that we've been able to pick up in a survey. Um, then further along on the bottom, we've got a turtle and turtles are, are quite small, but we've been able to pick it up. So um, half submerged uh, in the water column. And then, um, yeah, we've got a blasting shark and then because of our 1.5 centimeter pixel resolution images, we can um, ID roseate terns, which are obviously extremely similar to their um, to, to the Arctic and common terns. But we are able to um, yeah distinguish these sort of difficult to distinguish between species um, with this with the uh, uh, with the images that we can currently take, um, and you wouldn't be able to get this high level resolution from video. Uh, methods either. So yeah, so it's a huge advantage for positively identifying tricky to distinguish species, um, not just terns, but also uh, petrels and also um, very small species like phalaropes as well. We can, we can ID those. So we've gone from um, experts having to stand on a boat to ID um, birds in the flesh or marine mammals in the flesh um, to being able to uh, take really high quality images of the birds and have them ID'd and, and quality assured by a number of experts. So this is obviously a really um, huge leap in the evolution of these designs and also we're seeing evolution of um, the survey design um, and the data collection methods that are being used for these surveys as well. So when you're um, collecting your, uh, or when you're sort of designing your survey, um, the traditional method is to use transects and this um, mirrors the boat-based um, surveys as well, so just going up and down um, in lines along the site. Um, but we're uh, recommending um, for, and also uh, we're seeing um, clients want it more and more, a, a grid-based survey um, methods as seen on the right. Um, so your um, so if I go to the next slide. So transects, yes, they're more traditional, and they you can cover a large area quickly with fewer flight lines. 
So you're just going um, back and forth across the site. And you can, yeah, you can cover quite a large percentage of the area, but with um, fewer flight lines. Um, and then whereas the grid-based survey design, it's sort of it's underpinned by robust ecological survey methods of the quadrats that we all use in ecology at school. Um, and it's being used more and more because the this design allows you to survey the area much more evenly and this has a number of benefits. So firstly, if you start surveying and you're surveying every month um, and but your site changes for whatever reason and we have seen this um, happen quite a lot. So sites get smaller or change shape slightly. And with a grid-based survey design, you don't need to change your, your surveys, your flight lines, um, you'll just sort of cut them off at different lengths. And that's because the because you're serving it more evenly, your coverage stays the same no matter what site, uh, what size your site is. Whereas for the transects, you would actually have to change your survey design and your flight lines in order to maintain that percentage coverage that you wanted of your site. But also um, grid-based designs, your you've got gaps between your images, and you I should say this isn't possible with video um, methodology. This is the way we've set up or way of APEM set up the still cameras, we're able to get spaces between our images, which mean that they're all independent samples. Um, and this has a great benefit for your for um, undertaking statistical analysis um, after the survey. And that's because you've got a greater um, number of samples um, and this improves uh, reliability and precision of, of statistical analysis at the end. So I'm just going to show you through a couple of case studies from APREM's broad experience um, of undertaking marine wildlife surveys. And um, they're, I'll just, they're, they're both a little different just to um, sort of explain some of the other reason or some of the reasoning behind uh, the different survey methods. So APEM were commissioned by the Marine Institute to provide digital aerial surveys off the west coast of Ireland in summer 2020. <coughs> Ooh, sorry, I'm just taking a drink. And the main objective of the work was to look at the distribution and abundance of seabirds and marine megafauna within the defined target area. So it was a very large offshore survey, and so this does requ require careful planning by our operations team. Um, and the, um, because the area was so large, transects were used to cover the greatest proportion of the site as quickly as possible. Uh, transects were perfectly suitable here because it was just we just wanted to get a baseline characterization of the site just to see what's there. Uh, we're not trying to um, work out uh, if there, the ch a change or anything. Um, it's just one survey to see what's there in the summer. So. So yeah, so the transect uh, design was perfectly suitable and had the benefit, yeah, of covering the greatest proportion of the site sort of as quickly as possible because it we want uh, the site the the whole survey had to be undertaken between June and um, and the beginning of July. So here are a couple of images from that survey. Um, so we've got the I can show you the turtle again, another small one, but this time it is surfacing. We've also got a fin whale that's completely submerged and within the water column that we can see, uh, along with the sunfish. And on the right hand side is a group of basking shark. Uh, and you can see how far we can see into the water column because we've got the different layers of that, that group. And our image analysts were able to identify 29 sharks in this image. And so those are obviously the only, only the ones that are visible to us. We don't know how big that group was um, on that day. But, and also, so at the top, we've also got a guillemot crash. And so that's adults with juveniles. And we can tell that the, um, we can tell the different ages in the, the individuals because of their body size. Uh, so yeah, they're just, uh, the guillemot crash, they're just sitting on the water, two pairs, uh, an adult and a juvenile each. So this was a, a really huge um, survey that we undertook uh, off the coast of Ireland last year, uh, but, the scale of projects um, is always changing. And so this one is a, a much smaller site. It's the Carmarthen Bay Special Protection Area in Wales. And we've been contracted to undertake aerial surveys of this site um, over the last decade. 
and the SPA is designated solely um, for the population of wintering common um, scota and is the most important individual wintering site in Britain and Ireland for this species. So the aerial, the aim of these surveys was to produce a population estimate to feed into Natural Resources Wales monitoring of the site. So we did two surveys over the last winter. Um, and you can see that we used a grid based design for this survey. So we've got 29 uh, flight lines um, going north, north to south. Um, and then on each grid line, you can see there's the gaps between the images. Um, so we've got sort of independent samples along each uh, flight line. And so we're covering 22% of the area with these grids. Um, and the grid design was really crucial because the objective was to get a population estimate. We wanted to make sure that that population estimate was robust and as precise as possible. And we wanted, so we, thus we wanted to increase the number of samples that we were taking across that site. Um, so yeah, so that's why the grid-based design was so perfect for this, this project. Uh, we've got a couple of images here of uh, the birds that we took, um, the birds that were seen on the survey. So we've got Brent geese, sorry, Brent geese here um, in the shallows, uh, flying herring gull, and then obviously the main attraction, the common um, scoter. So, sort of taking you on a whistle stop tour of all the sort of different aspects of your survey design. Um, so we've gone from, well, would you, so to visual, from visual to aerial. Um, so you've got, well, so boat based to aerial, uh, visual to um, digital, and then so you've got options of um, still or video, and then and I've sh shown some of the benefits of the still imagery. Um, but obviously once you, once um, you've got taken the images, well, the, a team of in image analysis have to do a lot of work to ID every um, species that be can be seen in the imagery. And then um, I then, or someone like me, gets a lovely Excel spreadsheet with all that data in. And that's when you want to start thinking about the data analysis that you're going to take undertake. So as I've mentioned before, a very common um, uh, analysis that's undertaken for for, from the data from uh, digital aerial surveys, our population estimates. Now uh, you can sort of undertake these in different complexities and a quite a simple one is to use the de design-based abundances. Um, and so this uh, sort of relies on the number of species that you've seen in each sample um, and sort of multiplies up that to, this, to the whole site. So that's why it's important to survey an area as evenly as possible, um, because you're sort of assuming that that site is entirely the same across the whole of the whole thing, assuming that all the species that you saw in the surveys are sort of distributed evenly across it. Or sorry, you're not assuming that they're distributed evenly, but you're assuming that their number is uh, proportional to the size of the site. So you might think about the um, the numbers, so you might just want a nice number, of pop nice population estimate, but you also might want to think about how they're spread in that site, so the distribution of that um, species in the site, because you don't assume that they are spread evenly across it. So one way would be to create quite a simple heat map to show hotspots of individuals, and that's just created based on the clustering of um, individuals from that species. But there's also, um, you can also undertake more complex um, analysis and these complex analytical methods for undertaking spatial anal analysis are developing um, all the time and have developed quite a lot in the last 10 years. And these methods are also more commonly required by developers of offshore wind farms and the reg regulators uh, because yeah, they're, they're more robust than the this, um, this simpler design-based abundances. So I regularly undertake um, an analysis or a spatial analysis using the MRC package in R. Um, so that's a analysis software um, open source, which is used commonly um, in ecological sciences. Um, it was developed by scientists at the University of St Andrews, and it's um, particularly robust because you're using a lot of environment, you're putting a lot of environmental variables in to the model along with along with the um, 
the bird data that you've collected on your surveys. And so you're using the environmental variables to predict a spatial distribution, not just where you saw the birds, um, because you're needing, you want to predict where the birds are in the parts of the site that you didn't survey, because we can't survey the whole thing. Um, although it would be very nice if we did. So just on the right, um, I can show you the distribution of red-throated divers in the outer Thames Estuary SPA. And so at the top, you can see the yellow spots are where we saw the red-throated divers from the survey. You can almost see the sort of flight lines that were taken. And then at the bottom is the output from the spatial um, or MRC analysis. Um, and it's sort of just predicting the density of the red-throated divers across the site. And you can see that there's sort of a hot spot here in the northeast. Um, oh, I'm actually not sure if you can see my mouse, but um, so the northeast is, and there's a nice little red hot spot, but you can see that in the, um, in the east and then in the west as well, there, there are fewer um, individuals. And so the um, environmental variables that you can input into these models can be um, anything from bathymetry to uh, weather data to ship traffic, fishery traffic, uh, chlorophyll concentration. You want to, you want to include, oh, the more you include, um, sometimes the better. Um, but also you want to include variables that you think will impact that species distribution. Uh, so you can sort of think about what they eat or how they're disturbed. Um, so yeah, so you can use those to, to better inform your um, distribution predictions. So these are, I've just sort of gone over two methods used to understand abundance and distribution of species observed in the aerial digital surveys. But often, and especially for offshore wind farm developers, it is crucial to understand the behaviors of birds at the site and that um, and particular interest is flight height. So it's really important for offshore wind farm consenting process and that's because it's, uh, it's used to calculate the collision risk for a proposed wind farm and so you have to calculate the flight height and, and we can do that from the imagery and there's a couple of different um, methods used to calculate flight height from imagery. Um, but there's always errors associated with uh, flight height calculations and um, other, so from, from digital um, imagery, but also from, you could record it from a boat-based survey or tracking studies, putting a logger on a bird. Um, you can get readings of altitude on that as well, but there's always an error um, associated with those numbers. Um, so for, for the way we um, calculate Flight height, uh, the calculation is based on the size of the bird in the imagery. So you're measuring um, tail to beak and, and the wingspan. But if that bird is banking, um, so turning a corner, or maybe it's got its head down looking for food, then those measurements are going to be slightly, slightly smaller or slightly longer than that bird actually is. And that just means that you're sort of predicting a higher or a lower altitude for that bird. Um, so yeah, so there is um, errors associated with calculating it um, in, all of the, in all the ways that you can. So it would be really great if we could do uh, calculate flight height without a, um, a large amount of error. Um, and so that's why we're seeing one, uh, this sort of future of digital surveys um, is to use LIDAR. So LIDAR is commonly used for terrestrial mapping projects. Um, it's highly accurate and reliable, and it measures a distance to a target using a laser light. So a series of laser pulses are fired out and then they're reflected back to a sensor when they hit an object. And so you can measure the distance from the object to the sensor. And so um, this is commonly used in terrestrial um, projects. And you can see here some images of that and sort of details that you're able to get from the data. The color in these images, it represents uh, height. So you can, but you can just see the detail in the trees, uh, in the road, um, so it's yeah, incredibly detailed and accurate, um, but it definitely could be used in offshore environments. And that is currently what uh, we at APM are developing. So, um, so we want to develop it to calculate flight heights of seabirds. Uh, I can show you a terrestrial example um, that we undertook to measure the flight height of field fares that's on the right hand side. And 
the flight height of these birds is 12 and a half to 17 and a half meters above the ground and it's precision of about five centimeters which is just so so small compared to the error of any other way of calculating flight heights so uh, APEMA are sort of um, investing in this software um, and we're creating systems specifically designed for um, measuring flight heights uh, in the offshore environment. So we're gonna have a high resolution camera system aligned with the LIDAR system in one aircraft. And so as the cameras take images, we'll also be having, having the LIDAR taking, um, collecting data at the same time so that then you can have an image of the bird species. And then also a sort of, um, it's called a point cloud from your, um, from the LIDAR and you can match the bird in the image with the point cloud and so then you can say well this gannet was flying this high or this um, razor bill was flying this high um, and that's obviously the kind of level of data that you that um, is needed so it's a relatively new application of the technology but it will be a really good addition to any so survey program it's just a more targeted method to get this uh, to get the flight height uh, data and so the flight height um, data is really crucial. Um, I did mention it uh, because it goes into the collision risk modeling, which just feeds into how sort of um, the mortality of birds that will be associated, or that will be, um, that can be predicted for any proposed wind farm. And so obviously if you're putting more accurate flight heights into the models, then you're getting a more accurate ri risk and that benefits the developer and the regulator because you have more um, confidence in the data and it also just means that um, sort of any mitigation to prevent collision risk or compensation um, can be reduced because um, yeah there's no precaution around it it's it's a sort of it's much more known it's much more accurate so I've done a really whistle-stop tour here of uh, coming a long way from the visual surveys of scientists on a boat IDing birds and estimating flight heights from that boat to multiple studies being able to ID um, and quality assure identifications in high resolution imagery. Um, we've, gone, we've been able to create survey designs that improve uh, the robustness of the statistical analysis so that you can make greater predictions um, with the data and to now undertaking uh, LIDAR surveys to collect accurate flight height data. Um, which is an extremely useful piece of um, data for the offshore wind industry. So we, you can just see that we've come so far already in 10 years, you know, um, what else will be around the corner in the next 10? Um, yeah, it's all, uh, we, well, we're constantly trying to work out what the next step will be. And, and currently LIDAR is our, yeah, is the thing we're working on at the moment. So I do realize, I think I've sped through that quite a lot. Um, but if you have any questions, um, then I can take those now, or, or my colleagues can answer if they're um, if it's best for them. But thank you very much. Yeah, and, and thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. That was really, really, uh, very, very good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, just to mention that uh, if anyone has any questions, please use the Q and A slot. A few of them have come through there now. Um, I might kick off the the question in the Q and A if you if if that's okay. Um, just you had mentioned that you undertook a number of surveys, particularly for the Marine Institute in twenty twenty. Uh, I'm presuming one of the outputs for these surveys is some form of GIS or, or whatever, but what what is the availability of the data for uh, for the marine wildlife surveys and and is this information made publicly available or will it be in the future? You're on mute, there, Kate. <laughs> sorry, that was <laughs> I preempted my muteness. Um, sorry, that's a very good question. So the data that we collect is always the property of the client. Yeah. So for the Marine Institute, it would be up to them to uh, um, uh, share the data, how, how they saw fit, so um, on their website or, or if people could apply to use it. But that's totally um, yeah, up to them because it is their, they, they own that data. For um, offshore wind farms um, in the UK, at least, um, the lease agreements require data sets as shapefiles um, 
to be provided to the Crown Estate. And then these are shared online. There's a database, online database. Um, and then the developers can share more widely if they, if they prefer. Um, we actually, uh, I could show you, we actually have a, um, let me share my screen again. Uh, sorry, share screen. Shouldn't have come off it so fast. So this is actually, we actually have a, um, <clears throat> so what, well, sorry, in the uh, US, we have worked with clients um, to have a web portal. So where the um, data is readily available. So this is, this is just a screenshot of that portal um, and it is open um, to anyone. It's open to the public. And so that you can um, sort of see through and you can click through. Um, you've got, um, so currently this is the February 2020 data and we're just looking at all the birds. Um, and I think I took another screenshot of it. Yeah, so this was um, in May 2019. And these are all the turtles that were um, observed on that survey. So this sort of amazing, um, let me stop there, uh, sort of way of um, showing the data uh, to the public and getting them more involved with it. Um, and we definitely um, support open sharing of data. Uh, and yeah, so there, I know that there's a move to digital impact assessments and then we're very keen on sort of, yeah, get, making sure the data is open as well for those. Uh, very good. Um, just one other, um, just in terms of you're talking about the surveying for offshore wind farms, but what do you think is the greatest uh, impacts uh, of concern when surveying for offshore wind farms? Um, so for birds, it probably, be, well, it's the collision risk um, that I've talked about. Our modelling, it's really important that we uh, get that modelling right. Um, and use the information collected on the surveys for those. Uh, but we can also, um, birds are also impacted by displacement. So uh, from, from wind farms, so they won't be able to use the, they might not be able to use the area that, that wind farm is at. So they have to move, move their foraging locations. Um, there's also barrier effects because they have to fly, might be after, they might have to fly around a wind farm to get to their foraging locations or their breeding locations and that sort of, increases energy, energy expenditure. For marine mammals, um, underwater noise during construction is probably the greatest impact. Uh, it may seem temporary, so it's only happening while they're building, um, but there are actually potential um, for uh, population level effects. Um, so yeah, so it's really important to collect good baseline data before for to understand the impacts of um, offshore wind farms. And so that's the, that's the aerial um, survey methods. And then also marine mammals, you, you want to undertake sort of acoustic um, monitoring as well. Uh, very good, Kate. Um, I have a question here from Joe Breen, and I think Randall has um, typed an answer there, but just if, if Randall might want to weigh in a bit more to expand a little bit, just to give Kate a chance to catch her breath there. Um, <laughs> Joe, um, welcome Joe. Uh, your your question was, your, your fin whale looked like a blue whale. Uh, do you have a key diagnostic to split the species in an overhead uh, photo when you can't see the profile of the blow and how they dive? Now, Randall has provided an answer, but do you want to expand a little bit, Randall? Yeah, absolutely. So in, in this particular case, um, it's pretty clear in the photograph, you can see what is called a chevron, which is a white coloration. It's a V-shaped coloration that stretches from just behind the blowhole. It goes back in a V-shape along the body and it, before curling uh, and, and going back forwards along the body again, um, down the sides of the animal. That's pretty clear in that, in that particular photo, those chevrons. Um, but of course, because we know um, flight heights and, and the exact resolutions and everything, we can also, we know the size of the animals. You can also use size, particularly in those species that would be more similar in shape, but very different in size. Um, so you can certainly for, for some of the dolphin species um, and between beaked whales and that kind of thing, if you were lucky enough to see those, of course, um, size can play a very big uh, role in 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 uh, identifying in between different species of marine mammals. Uh, okay, thank thank you very much, Randall. Uh, another 
to two quite well there's a comment from samantha that all your images seem really good um has this improved the identification of seal species i've seen it at 50 percent in the past uh, and then well we can answer that one if, who wants to take that one and then we come I, back to i can thing. take that one so uh yes as the resolution of the images improves uh the identification of those type of species does improve um part of the issue with the seal species is is also the turbidity and the clarity of the water of which they're in um you might have noticed quite a variety of sea backgrounds in the images that we showed and it does depend on where we're undertaking the surveys but yeah 1.5 centimeter we can see far more detail on those species than we could previously at sort of three five centimeter uh, very good and at the first part of samantha's question apologies is where do you get your availability bias estimates from for marine mammals do you often have site specific estimates or do you use published information on dive uh, surfacing durations from other studies so we would use all available information. So um, anything from published studies, if there is site specific information, then we can incorporate that. Um, essentially, we try to, to make it as robust as we can with all available data. Uh, very good. And final question from Richard Gibbs. Uh, you, oh, wait to light. Uh, second last question for Richard Gibbs. Do you consider water depth when calculating population densities of marine mammals in order to account for individuals below the sea surface? Is it still a consideration when undertaking aerial digital sampling? I can take that one. So again, it comes back to the clarity and um, turbidity of the water, depending on how far through that water column you can see, depending on the weather on the day and the location that you're analysing. So what we tend to find with the digital methods is that we actually see larger numbers because we can see into the sea surface than you might see on a visual survey, for instance. So it's quite a difficult thing to take into account when you're looking at the population estimates. And generally, you would get a relative abundance rather than absolute abundance. And last question from Mike Armitage. How is LIDAR's performance on flight height measurements when birds are near the sea surface? Is there a clutter? How might that bias be accounted for in deriving flight height distribution from LIDAR? Yes, so when you get close to the sea surface, there will be, you'll obviously get the reflection off the sea surface as well. Um, what you generally find is that, that there's a sort of a relative window of where that clutter might sit. So you know that those birds will be within, say, 20 centimetres of the sea surface. Um, therefore, those birds particularly are not going to be at risk of collision. So they wouldn't be counted in the rotor swept area for collision risk modelling. So it's not likely to bias it because you know that they're in flight from the um, still imagery and you know that they'll be within a certain amount of the sea surface. So they can still be included in the analysis rather than discounting them. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the questions. You can all take a break now. Thank you very much. Answered very, very well. Um, so I'm going to just go through very quickly um, some of our upcoming events. Uh, as always, um, our all upcoming events for SIWEM are available to view on the SIWEM website. Uh, all SIWEM Northern Ireland specific events will also be highlighted on our social media platforms. That is for Twitter, SIWEM underscore NI, and LinkedIn is SIWEM Northern Ireland branch. And as mentioned previously, all of our videos and all these um, presentations are made available on the, Sci, uh, the, on the SIWEM YouTube channel. So it's very, very worth subscribing to. So in terms of our upcoming events uh, within Northern Ireland, it's hard to believe it, but this is my last technical event in the 2020-2021 uh, programme. So that year has just gone in no time at all. So our next SciWeb Northern Ireland event will be our AGM, and that will take place on the 3rd of August 2021. So it's planned to be a virtual AGM. 
same as last year. So I, I can hope you can all join us to, to support uh, support the event and see uh, Robert Smith of McAdam Design getting sworn in as the 35th uh, chair of SciWem Northern Ireland, which is a huge uh, achievement uh, since its establishment in 1987. So a notice will be uh, issued in the coming weeks and we have that AGM. So uh, if you want to make a submission or, or anything like that. So in terms of the wider SIWEM community. There's a number of upcoming events. The next one on the 27th of May 2021 will be uh, an upscaling, rewilding and nature recovery through the rewilding network and that will be hosted by the Southwestern branch. As This event will be free to attend but booking is essential and this is your last chance to book on to that event. And then the next big event within SIWEM will be the Flood and Coast Conference and Expo. 2021. The, the conference will have a, a diverse range of speakers, including industry experts, uh, academics, uh, representatives from local uh, authorities, NGOs, governments, and, and people representing local communities. The full lineup for that event, uh, it's over four, held over four days, and the full lineup is available to view on the SciWEM website. Each session will be designed to generate debate with um, a live chat function allowing uh, you, the, the audience, to post your questions, comments, and ideas for the panelists and the wider audience. So prices for this event varies depending on the number of days that you want to attend. But as I say, full details are available on the SciWEM website. This event uh, will be hosted by SciWEM, but in partnership with the Environment Agency. So just to make a note of a health and safety moment, if you like, uh, Saturday the 22nd of May marked the International Day of Biological Diversity or Biodiversity day um, so a little bit about the United, about that day the United Nations proclaimed it the 22nd of May as International Biodiversity Day uh, to increase our understanding and awareness of biodiversity issues uh, the 2021 slogan we're part of the solution uh, was chosen to be the continuation of the momentum generated last year uh, under the overarching theme uh, our solutions are in nature, which serves as a reminder to us all that biodiversity uh, remains uh, the answer to several sustainable development challenges from nature-based solutions uh, to climate, health issues, food and water security and sustainable livelihoods. So in, in essence, biodiversity is the foundation upon which we can uh, build back better. So that's something to just to bear in mind. And um, also it's worth noting that the UN decade of uh, biological diversity began in 2021 and that will run until 2030. Um, so just worth noting that. So Coming on to the closing, uh, I'd like to give a note of thanks uh, to Kate, Dr. Kate Rogerson, Randall uh, Cunahan, and uh, and of course Stephanie uh, McGlovern of APEM for joining us today and giving us a very fantastic presentation on the evolution of uh, marine wildlife survey design. Um, really, really informative presentation and really well answered questions as well. So thank you very much. Um, so also a big thank you, as always, to Barbara Woods and Jane Boland from SciWEM, who are constantly working away in the background to making sure that all, event, all events within all branches and all our technical programs are running smoothly. Uh, so a lot of the work is done in the background. So thank you for all of uh, your help and support over the last year. Uh, and also a big thank you to you all for taking this uh, time to join us and support this event and indeed all events during the past year. So I hope you found uh We're, we're a relatively uh, friendly group of people and we're always keen to keep our members uh, CPD up to date. So. Um, so we would always welcome any feedback that you have. So if there's any topics you'd like to see covered, please let us know. Our SciWEM email address is SciWEM underscore NI at Outlook.com. Um, but anyway, as I say, it is a uh, five to two. Uh, so I'm going to officially close this meeting. So uh, that's all from me. So until the next time, uh, stay safe. Thank you.